buy someone to work with and talk with? Can I talk to you? Yep. If you okay. So oh, yeah, sure. Okay, great. And if you want to just find somebody real quick, or sit, sit by people, because it's going to be an interactive session. So I'm Julie Graber, and it's um, I think 3:52, so we're getting started. I appreciate everybody staying for the last session. I never like to present the last session because you know people have to leave or. They feel like they've had uh, enough for the day. So I'm um, glad to see I have people here. Mm -hmm. Things are weird. Does anybody know how to do this? Use these? Does anybody use these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that, does that mean I have to stay put? No. No, no. I think it's just charging. It's charging. Okay, thank you. Gotcha. Oh, does so everybody have the link? So make sure you're everybody, um, uh, hopefully a neighbor comes up. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is going to be kind of interesting to uh, talk about a tough topic and learn about a topic such as PBL in 50 minutes. <laughs> okay? So we'll do my best. I'll do my best. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Julie Graber. I'm an instructional technology consultant with Prairie Lakes AEA, and I am just curious who's in the room. So for elementary, who do we have here? Okay. How about middle, high school, and other? Okay. And other administrators. <coughs> Consultants. Just flip between the two districts as a special ed. Got it. And higher education. Okay, higher ed. Awesome. Well, welcome. So we have a good mix. That's always a challenge too. Um, so um, in terms of the outcomes today, um, probably some lofty outcomes, but three outcomes that I have um, designed around. One is to understand the difference between project-based and project-oriented. Um, another one is to use tools to help determine um, the quality of a project-based learning and know how to make it better. And lastly, getting some ideas for own projects. So the last thing that we're going to do, um, this will be my test of how well um, I shared information with you, how well you learned the information through your discussion and through the different resources and tools that I've um, exposed you to, is for you to actually take something that's project-oriented and with a few minutes and a few other people to design it so it's more project-based. So that's our challenge before you guys leave. Okay. All right, so I want you to think, first of all, individually about a time. A time when you were professionally or personally very engaged. Time flew. You were just so enthralled in what you were doing um, that Again, you were just highly engaged. Think about that time, and then think about what conditions were present during that time, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little quiet time to think, and then I want you to talk to somebody next to you about some of those conditions. Collaboration. What else? 
Choice. High engagement. What? High engagement. High engagement. Choice. Choice. What else? Applicable. Applicable. Accountability. Accountability. Challenging. Challenging. Big block of time. Time to do it. But there's some risk involved. Risk. The audience. Audience. Anything else? All right. So, click. I'm going to click on click. And you can too. All right. So, there are elements of human motivation that when we design instruction, where we have these elements present and the more that we have the more likely kids are going to be engaged therefore learning will take place okay so as you think about what you just said notice the connection as we look through and down click was there any that someone did not mention. <clears throat> What's there? Maybe the knowledge of results, That's maybe. Result. Right. So we all know. We all know how we can, how we like to be engaged in the same, same ways that we like to, to be engaged, our kids like to be engaged, too. Okay? So, as you think about, not even just a project-based learning unit, as you think about your lessons that are coming up, you know, as, you, as those of you that are in here are support um, folks for instructional coaching or AA folks, okay, thinking about, you know, design, designing what you do with people for your professional development. Which elements do you typically have in place? Which elements do you not? And is there an element that you could start working on to increase the number of elements in your instructional design? That would be a good kind of a, what is it, Monday morning application, the next day kind of application that probably most of you could do. So I'm going to leave you with this and we're going to transition into our eight essential elements um, through um, the Buck Institute. But I want, what I want to tell you is um, when we look at the acronym CLICK and you see the first letter of each one, a good way to remember that is when you have these conditions present, then in your classroom things just CLICK, right? So now let's take this, keep this in mind as we move back to um, an overview of eight essential elements, and I'm using the Buck Institute. So I'm clicking on this overview where it says eight essential elements. And this is just, um, this is a project design rubric, and you can all do that too, but I can kind of zoom in. So there are these elements <coughs> on the left-hand side, such as key knowledge and understanding and success, challenging problem or question, sustained inquiry, authenticity, student voice and choice, reflection, critique and revision, and a public product. So it shows on the continuum, on the left hand side, it shows what it <coughs> looks like when done well. High level quality. In the middle, not so much, and on the, on the other side or the right, it's you know, a little bit weaker. So this is a tool that you can use to analyze work that you're doing, work that you see on the internet. Um, could be a, a way to design work. Um, could be used in lots of different ways. Okay, so take a look at these elements. Just kind of skim through them on your, um, on your device. And also look at the description too. So if there's something that you're not quite sure about, then now you have a better idea. And then also think about the connection to click the elements of key motivation. So I'll give you a minute or two to do that.
talk with the people next to you in terms of what did you notice in terms of comparison, and is there a particular element that maybe you weren't as familiar with, and what would that be and why? This is what the brain, how the brain loves to learn. <laughs> how can we design our instruction more so that we can have these kinds of elements happening in a classroom? Okay, so that's the intent. Um, and I said that wrong. For some reason, I thought on the left-hand side was the, the quality. <laughs> it's the right-hand side. So I apologize for that. Because typically, I would think that, it, I don't know, I like to read left to right. But anyway, you got the idea. Because as soon as you read the description, you're like, oh, yeah, that's not probably the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I want you guys to keep those elements in mind. Because what we're going to do next is I'm going to ask you to take what you know um, hopefully some background knowledge, but then also the limited amount of information just from this project design rubric with the description. And I want you to look for two elements within a unit, okay? Now, here's the deal. So we're going to be on the analysis and redesign. So I'm going to put you in groups of eight, okay? There'll be four people in that, or yeah, did I say eight groups? Let's see. Yes, I want eight people. Um, and then people will be looking for, two people will be looking for two different elements within the same unit. They have a conversation about whether they agree or disagree, where they find evidence of that. And then if, they, if you find that something is weak or missing, then talk about how you would make it stronger or present. What would you do? Okay and you'll have that collaboration, okay? Um, so, here's the, here's the task at hand. While you guys are doing this, then you guys as um, an individual or people that are sitting next to you need to make the decision whether you believe it's project-oriented or project-based and why, okay? So that's where we're headed. All right, so, um, I'm gonna number off first so you guys remember your groups. And then I'll give the instructions of where you um, access the unit. And the unit is right here. So you guys could probably just click on that unit. Okay, study the unit. And then um, we'll do the group numbering. And then I'll give you the next set of instructions. All right, so here's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, you're all group one. Okay? You're going to be starting with group two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You guys are all group two. All right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You guys are group three. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You guys are group five, right? Four, four, four. What were you? Three. You guys are three? Okay, four. Seem like I need more. Okay, so you guys are group four. All right, so this is what you're going to do. You're going to click on that unit. Then you're going to click on this graphic organizer where it's, it says GO and it's red and a spreadsheet will pop up. Okay, you will see your tab at the bottom. We have group one's tab here. Raise your hand if you're group one. Okay, group two, raise your hand. There's a tab at the bottom. Group three, group four. All right, so here's what you're doing. We have eight people <coughs> and you have eight elements. For some reason I was thinking more people, but that's okay. So I'm gonna have, um, why don't we have, let's see. Okay, I changed this, I'm sorry, let's see. Two, three. Why don't we just go with um, each of you find both one, the, just one element within that particular um, unit, since we have eight people. I was gonna do it different, and now I'm kinda messed up. So that would probably be the easiest. Okay, so, so you guys, why don't you guys decide within your team? Do or number. You, you, do you, yeah, just do the number. If you remember it, yep. will you remember? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, perfect. So what you're going to do is look at the unit, find the central element, and see if there's evidence, and you're going to record it on your tab below. If you, 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 one thing I want to share with you on this unit, pay attention to the right hand side where it says at a glance. Okay? There's some key information there on the right hand side. There's one right here, and I'm only using one of them. <laughs> you have that book. I have um, one in every day. <laughs> oh, wow. Gosh. You better be moving quickly.
responses and as we think about the eight essential elements and if we're using those elements to determine whether it's project-based learning or project oriented we need to make that decision we need to call that into question so how many of you think based off of the evidence that's been collected by your team members that you would say that it's a project-based learning unit Raise your hand if you think it's a project-based learning unit. Raise your hand. Okay, a little bit. Anybody else? How many of you believe it's project-oriented? Raise your hand. Okay, most of you. How many of you think um, it's kind of a mix? Okay, how many of you didn't vote? <laughs> right, okay. So, if we're not sure what project-oriented is, um, here's an example that might help you. Looking at this shoebox globe, let's look at that. Okay? I'm not sure what happens in your schools, elementary, middle, or high. Um, but we see quite a bit of projects like this. Okay? This is a shoebox float. Must be about maybe the state or something. It's like a state bird, state flower, I'm thinking. I'm not sure. But that's what it kind of looks like. Okay? Um, another example might be here's a pagoda. So there are facts on this pagoda, um, World Civ Chinese pagoda that um, freshmen created. So how would we compare, if that's project-oriented, those two are project-oriented, and we're looking at this unit, 
and we're trying to say, is it project-oriented or project-based? Now what? What does that tell us? I think that the end product is too important. I mean, it's too, it's too much the same for oh. everybody. Okay. For it to be individualized and to be okay. what the kids really. So the end product is the same for everybody? Yeah. Okay. I can't tell what you learned from looking at your shoebox. Okay. I mean, I know you know how to use glue, and I know you know how to use scissors, mm -hmm. and that you know how to look up facts. Mm -hmm. But we checked off those standards much many years ago. Sure. So would you say there's sort of a continuum, maybe, a project oriented from the shoebox and the pagodas to maybe this unit to something beyond that unit? Would we say maybe there's a little bit of a continuum? that maybe it's project oriented and then it moves into a little bit of PBL, but not it's still kind of project-ish, it's too much project-ish. Now we're moving into more learning, thinking, questioning, right? So if we don't have those conversations and we're still kind of supporting the floats or the, I mean, I don't care if it's float or floats or pagodas, we see them all the time. And there's a lot of instructional time that's wasted as a result of that. Okay? So we got to think about how much time do we have. And if we want to go deep with something, let's substitute some of these things for something deeper. So back to <laughs> this unit. Some of you, um, is it Justin? Yeah. You thought that it was more project based learning. Why do you think that? I think that. It can be if it's taken a little bit more because there is an essential question and it's left a little bit vague. I guess now that I'm thinking about it, it was very, very specific and it wasn't, there wasn't really necessarily the authenticity, but I think that it could be changed to make it more authentic, to make it a little bit, the question a little bit deeper learning more looking at a big picture because like right now they're they have to create one thing that could possibly be used for a younger student that could just answer the question what is a hero that's very general and could just get more specific mm -hmm. okay so you're kind of swaying back a little yeah, bit yeah. okay that's okay how about those of you that thought it was project oriented why did you believe it was project oriented not project based learning what did you see in there Made you think that? Yes. I thought it was very structured um, with all our discussions. The teacher had specific questions that they had to answer, mm -hmm. or if they were <coughs> excuse me, journaling, they had specific questions they had to answer, and then their end product was also very specific. Um, even though they could pick their own hero to write about, it was still the end project. End product was all pretty much the same. Okay. They couldn't really like, expand or be creative about that. Okay, so we're talking really about everybody had to do pretty much the same thing for the same kind of audience mm -hmm. for the most part, right? They did have choice in the hero. Okay. Did you find learning? Was there standards or targets? There standards there. Okay. Well, at least it said which standards from the Common Core. Okay. Was supposed to be. So I think what people, what I hear people saying is that there was majority of the elements were there, but there were few that were really either, they're probably weak, I mean, or maybe maybe slightly miss, missing. So would we suggest that if somebody dived into project-based learning first time, would this be acceptable as a start? To have every kid create the same product? Every kid, you know, in, in terms of the audience, as a, as a way to begin this journey? It'd be a nice precursor if they're not accustomed to doing projects in your particular classroom. If that's not a schema they already have, uh -huh. doing a matching project is a nice way to get them rolling. Sure. So one of the things that when I talk with teachers and work with administrators is that um, we can't expect teachers who typically don't design instruction this way and will allow kids a lot of freedoms to do to have an amazing project-based sure learning unit that. with eight essentials that are strong that's just unreasonable right if they're thinking that they have to do that in order to be project-based learning they'll never get they'll never ever start so i'm okay with this because it's a heck of a lot further along than that pagoda and that shoebox 
right? But that doesn't mean we stop there. We have these conversations. We have opportunities for teachers to collaborate where we have tools like the project design rubric, right? And some other tools that I'm gonna show you. So that through conversation, like Justin and what was your name? Bailey. Bailey were saying, you know, hey, could we open it up so that not everybody has to have that same product to those same audiences? You know, let's talk about that. What are some ideas? You know, so that let them the first time do this where it's a little bit more structured because not only will the teacher need that, so will probably his or her kids because the kids aren't used to that either. So we have to think about that as well. Yes. I think also from an assessment, like a realistic assessment point of view, where you have a unit where it has a defined rubric, then to go back and extrapolate and say, okay, like this is one option, but to have that rubric where all kids are meeting the same kind of assessment criteria, that seems to be a more plausible place for these. Absolutely, and that's a, thanks for bringing that up because the conversations that, the, the feedback that I get from teachers when it's varied product or varied performance is that assessment. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, it's not about the product or performance, right. right, right now. Because what I'm looking for are the concepts surrounded by the standards and the thinking. So let's just put those two criteria out of rubric. <laughs> let's work on that, because that's really what I'm after. I'm not after all this other stuff. I mean, I don't know how often you guys use rubrics or look at rubrics, your own rubrics, but there's a lot of fluff on those rubrics. I don't see a lot of meat. So if you're trying to revamp your assessments and looking at your, 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 the, the rubric that attaches to your assessment, think about what are those important concepts connected to my standards and that thinking that I want to have happen through this process. And those are the only two criteria that I'm going to use to assess this. Then guess what? I don't care what the product is, or what the performance is, or who the audience is, because those two things are the most important right now. <coughs> okay? So I'm, uh, I'm going to segue us into um, um, this next piece, thinking about the tools. But I want to mention, those of you that are elementary, I do have a primary example. And also be thinking, if you want to take any of this back, you can easily make, make a copy, clear out the content, and you can do this with your own teachers, okay, or your own department. But there is a primary example, too, that um, you could use if you were elementary. All right, so thinking about going deeper. So Scott McCloud likes to talk about three big shifts that we need to be moving more of our instruction and assessment around. We need to move from low-level thinking where the focus has been on factual recall, procedural kind of regurgitation um, tasks that we, we see too often in, in our classrooms. Where we can see more kids and more often doing high level thinking, where they're engaging cognitive complexity, where they're creating and problem solving and they're being good communicators and collaborators. Another shift that we need to think about is how can we move from analog, where we see paper, ring binders, notebooks, to more digital opportunities, where kids are working in these digital spaces with the internet and then the global learning spaces that are available. How can we shift more of our um, instructional design in that realm? And then also teacher-directed, the third shift. Classrooms that are overwhelmingly teacher-directed. This was pretty much, this was kind of teacher-directed. There was a little bit of student-centered, but for the most part, it's teacher-directed. How can we think about uh, relinquishing those um, reins where there's more student agency? Kids are having control a little bit more of what, when, where, why, and with whom. So I want you to keep those shifts in mind as we transition into a couple more tools that we're going to look at. So if there's eight elements, where do I start in the designing or redesigning process? Well, I believe that you should start with the key knowledge, understanding, and success. That's probably why it's listed as number one on that, on that project design rubric. 
Because if you don't know where you're going, right, anywhere will, anywhere will get you there. So how do we know if knowledge is key or not? And how can we ensure that students understand at deep levels and are being set up for success? So um, one way that I thought about this as I was um, designing this workshop is um, looking at a tool that um, Scott McCloud and I developed a few years back called the Trudica. How many of you have seen or heard of that tool before? Okay, a few of you. So we decided to create this tool that really couples um, thinking, learning, and tech together. Okay? Um, and so one of the components as I looked at this um, that I thought kind of overlaid nicely with key knowledge, understanding, and success is our discipline-specific inquiry. That component, to me, connects with key knowledge, understanding, not so much success. Success would be more about that scaffolding and that practice, and that's really not part of the Trudicat um, component. So we have, within that inquiry, we have domain knowledge. Kids thinking about and working around discipline-specific and relevant knowledge, skills, and dispositions. Important themes and concepts. Not trivia and minutia. Not topics. We also have kids being engaged in discipline-specific and relevant practices and processes. The link that I have here under domain practices has to do with um, math, science, and ELA practices. Those are the things that we want kids to be doing connected to the content. Okay? If you have not seen that visual before, um, go ahead and click on that. And then the domain technologies. How are students utilizing discipline-specific and relevant technologies? So if I'm working around important concepts steeped in discipline, and I have the practices that real people in that field do outside of school, what are the technologies that are supporting that work? What, do sci what technologies do scientists use? What technologies do artists use? And how are we allowing kids to use those technologies in our classrooms? Or are we? And if we aren't, maybe we should consider doing that. A Chromebook, an iPad, and a laptop is not what we're talking about. We're talking about domain technologies that people in the field actually use to create and design and do their work. So, that's how I believe you can think about, hmm, if I'm really focusing on knowledge understanding, I, I need to be thinking, thinking through those three areas. The next um, element that I want to highlight, actually two of them, public product and authenticity. How do we know that students are creating and presenting their work, and I like to say product or, and or performance. I don't think it should, could just, can be just a product, so I like to expand that to other people beyond their classmates and teacher so they can, they can be informed or persuaded. All right, so let's look at that. Here we have the essential elements, authenticity, and public product. The Trudicat component here is authenticity and relevancy. Here are the two questions. Is student work authentic and reflective of that done by real people <coughs> outside of school? If the answer is no, then how can we make it so? Is student work made um, to contribute to an audience beyond the classrooms? What was the example in the hero? It was to other elementary students and wasn't it to like elderly? Yeah. 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 So to me that's kind of a weak attempt, a little better, but it's a little bit weak. Okay? Well now here's another tool that I think might help people. So this is called an authenticity filter. So in the work that I've done with, um, and you guys can click on that link um, on, your screen, on your device, the work that I've done with the AIW Students in a Classrooms PDL, people really struggle with um, thinking about authenticity. So here's um, a colleague of mine and I put this together to kind of help people frame that. So if we started out with, there's some kind of authentic goal that people need to take on. 
So here's a problem or challenge people in the workforce encounter. It's real world. What is that? We have to know what that is. Then we think about, well, who in that, who, who is um, tackling that problem or challenge? Who is that? Is that an artist? Is it a doctor? Is it a lawyer? Is it an illustrator? Who is it? Doesn't matter. It's somebody in the real world that does it. Now we think about our audience. Once I know what my problem is, and I know what role I'm playing, now I think of my audience. What does the audience that I need, that I'm tackling this problem or this solution for, who needs that? So I think of my audience after my role and after my problem. In education, we don't do that. We think about the pagoda, the shoebox float, the PowerPoint, the Prezi, the brochure, all that. We think of product first. We're in the green box way too much, whether it be technology or not. We need to shift that, okay? Because our product and performance is driving everything. That's the wrong way. So think about that problem or challenge. Think about the role. <coughs> then think about that audience. And then what makes sense for the audience? What makes sense for that audience to have? Is it a presentation? Is it a proposal? What is it? Well, it depends, okay? So I, that's another challenge I'm gonna offer you in a smaller way, not a PBL way, but a smaller way, as we think about lesson design even, not PBL design, is are you guys focusing too much on that green box? And if so, how could you shift that? What would that take and what would that look like? All right, so finally, what technologies can support these elements and other elements? This is one of my favorite resources by my colleague, Verna Jean Porter. And she has categorized various technologies and tools by function. And the reason why is because technology comes and goes. We can't think about tools and apps and websites. We've got to think about function. So if we know we want kids to collaborate and reflect all those things in, in our eight essential elements, if we know we want them to create these final products based off of the audience, how might this resource help us and help kids open up possibilities for them and think about the technology that's connected to the product and performance? So don't think about the product and performance first and don't think about the technology first. Once you've determined the product or performance, or once the kids have determined it, then they can go to the appropriate area and say, oh, yeah, this makes sense. I want to use this tool. I want to use this app. I want to use this website. Because it's around function. It's not because of what I already know or what the teacher shared with me. So here's my last challenge to you guys. I want you, in the time that we have left, to take a look at this scenario. And I want you to think about how you can, with a couple people next to you, switch this up to be a small scale version of a PBL. Read this scenario and then visit with a partner about how you could switch it up. Talk with people next to you. What ideas could you could you do to to make this a redesign in the amount of time you have?
Okay, what ideas do you have? Let's hear them. What ideas do you have to, to redesign this? Not everybody has to do a poster. What? Not everybody has to do a poster. Okay. Not every, and you know what? That would be okay if you have a teacher that could start to open up the reins a little bit, right? Maybe change that. Okay? What other comments or thoughts do you have? What's the concept? What's the concept? What's what do you guys think? There's what are we no, dealing with here? There is no concept there. Well, There's I thought no we, we needed the problem of fixing the water quality at Beads Lake. I live by Hampton. Um, and so it needs to be real for the kids. So, and have some real water samples and some real, real. Right. So, so back to Mary Ann's question about the con the concepts connected to standards. We would look at probably the environment with the human human um, effects or impact. Right. Either humans are doing something to the environment or somebody is. Right. And there's standards that that address that. So we want to be kind of keying up in on, you know, key concept connected to a standard or two initially. And like you said, now, we're, now we have a problem, right? We have a need to know. There's a problem at whatever lake, right? This, was a, this is what's going on. 